Alrighty, it's Memorial Day weekend, and I didn't get a video out because I am really busy paying bills and day-to-day -day life and all that good stuff. However, um, I did get some time to get some stuff done, so I want to do this video as an update. Uh, also say thank you to the people that did feedback, and that's what this video is about. Um, so I'm going to do a short video with a quick overview not of the game system itself, but the mechanics that drive the game. Um, because, while I really don't want to kind of undercut the game too much, I'd like the people that are interested and like the format to go out and buy the book, because it's not expensive. Um, and I don't get paid for this. This isn't any kind of sponsored thing. It's just, you know, 30 bucks for a good game system is cheap. So, that's where we're at. Um, I have expanded the um, the basic soldiers and followers, followers? No, followers even, of the Blue Nun. I mean that at the end. And then um, I'm going to, following this, me talking to camera, um, I'm going to do an overview of the base mechanics, as I've just said. And also, someone also had the um, good idea of doing an intro to each character that hopefully won't get killed and therefore will be recurring. So I will do a very short overview of the people in the warband. Um, now, the next actual playthrough I'm going to do, um, I've got some dungeon tiles made and stuff. I'm um, pretty those up a little bit, but uh, I kind of want to do a scenario inside the underground library of them clearing it out, making it ready for a base. Once that's done, um, then from there they can forage out to different places. But I kind of want to keep it uh, in in story mode, you know. So uh, the first one, which was a base overview and run through of the game for me, uh, was them actually getting to the underground library. The next one will be clearing the underground library and maybe finding some usable stuff down there. There was no treasure in the first one. There will be treasure in the second one. Um, yeah, so it's just really a matter of me finding time, um, getting away from paying bills and getting some time to myself to do what I want to do instead of what I have to do. And uh, appreciate people's patience. I also appreciate the feedback you guys have given. Um, and the other thing I need to do, um, which you'll see when I do the overview of the added soldiers is going to get some painting done, which I will video and put into the paint and alchemy. So, you know, there's a little bit of content coming. It's just finding the time. So anyway, the rest is coming. Thanks for watching. If I don't say at the end of this and um, have fun. Okay, and here we have the updated soldier sheet, which shows the war band that goes in with the Blue Nun. Um, you saw on the first one, uh, the top is that Templar that we had in the first episode called Hamrick. Um, now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Frostgrave, um, the attribute numbers are M for movement, F is fighting, that's the plus that gets added to his D20, S for shooting, which is a plus if he shoots anything on his D20, a is armor, which is the amount of points that get absorbed from a successful attack against him. W is willpower, which is basically his save against magic. And H, which is his health. So he starts with 12 hit points. Um, items, uh, he's, got, he's armed with a two-handed hammer and heavy armor. So that's the Templar we saw in the first episode there so new additions are Emmett which is an archer who has a little bit you know he's faster he's not as much armor he's got a bow dagger leather armor uh, plus two shoot plus one attack um, armor's just 11 health 10 so light infantry after that we have Grog a dwarf who is an infantryman um, he's armed with a two-handed weapon, although the model has two one-handed weapons. Um, I kind of like the model, so we just use that. Um, again, infantryman, so movement six, plus three attack, uh, zero shoot, 11 armor, 
zero wisdom, 10 health. Um, and then uh, below that is Flint, which is another dwarf, a dwarf slayer. Um, also an infantryman, same stats, two-handed weapon, leather armor. Um, below that, we have the mysterious apothecary. Um, so he actually starts every game with a healing potion, and he can use that healing potion on other figures during the game. So not much of a fighter. Movement six, plus one fight, zero shoot, ten armor, three willpower, and twelve health. So, you know, he can go down pretty quick, but, you know, he's also no weakling. And then, lastly, we have Edgar, who is a man-at-arms. Um, he's got a movement of six, plus three attack, uh, fight, sorry, and then zero shoot, 12 armor, one uh, willpower, and 12 health, and he's armed with a sword and a shield. So that is her warband that she now has um, and which she will be using to clean out the underground library uh, and going forward from there, unless one of them dies. So I did get some questions about um, the combat, how that was working. And, you know, um, people saying that's probably a good idea to give an overview how it works. Again, I didn't want to go too much in detail. I was trying to carry that with the narrative, but here's a quick overview um, answering the feedback that I got. And again, thanks very much for the feedback. Okay, let's get on to the combat mechanic and activations and such. So here we have Templar and the Goblin facing off. Now the Templar gets the wins initiative. Now he gets his first activation in which case he is going to move right there next to the Gobbo and initiate combat with his second activation. To commence combat, each combatant rolls a d20. So, Gobbo's got a 13. He's got a 17. You then take the fight adjustment in the stat line. So, for the temperance it's plus 4, which gives him a 21. For the Goblin, he's only got a plus 2, which gives him a 15, which means he has won the combat. So Templar's won the combat because the d20 roll plus his fight adjustment is higher than the Goblin's d20 roll plus the Goblin's fight adjustment. So the Templar's combat roll was 21, 17 plus 4 that he gets. So 21 points hits the Goblin, plus... The weapon gives a plus two. So now we're up to 23 points get through the goblin. The goblin has 10 armor. So from the 23, we take off 10, 13. The goblin's only got six hit points. He's a dead goblin. That is how basically the combat mechanic works. You get the d20 roll plus your combat adjustment highest score the points go through minus the defender's armor is how much damage happens now that is extremely swingy and that's why i love this game if he was fighting two goblins the second opponent gives a plus two so that would have been a 16 still would have lost but let's say let's give him a new roll so 15 Plus one for his fight, 16, and then plus two for support is 18. And he only rolls a one, 18. <laughs> he gets a plus four, gives him five. So these win with an 18. The 18 comes through to him. He has a, he has a 12 armor. He gets six points of damage. That's how combat works. Hopefully I've explained it easily enough but the amount of swing because you have 20 and not just 60s or is quite nice shooting basically works the same oh, man. now if you've attacked an enemy and you move first combat is is an activation turnover so if i charge you because you fought you can do nothing on your turn if you go after me in the same turn. 
So, for example, Templar wins initiative, moves into combat, his first activation and his second activation does combat. That means these have had an activation. When it becomes the Goblin's turn, these have already done something. So you're kind of really gaining the advantage in the initiative by charging. Shooting, let's say he's shooting at the Templar. Exactly the same as combat, except that if the Templar wins, it just means he dodged the arrow. If the Goblin wins the combat, that means the arrow hit and he takes the respective damage. If you are firing into combat, you, you roll first to see, it's a 50-50, which one you're going to hit. And then you roll combat accordingly. So, firing into combat is not advised unless you really don't care because you're a goblin. The casting mechanic is quite simple in that every spell you have has a cast number. The closer the spell is aligned to your main school of magic, the easier it will be to cast. Also, as you gain experience, um, you can uh, put points in to make things easier to cast. So, um, for example, she wants to cast Blinding Light on this goblin. It's a line of sight spell. She can see him, he's in range. She needs an eight plus and rolls a five, it fails. However, what you can do in Frostgrave is eat up hit points to make it succeed. So if she eats up three hit points, take three damage, she can make that succeed on that goblin. Also, if you fail a spell by five or more, there is a table because your wizard will take damage for failing the spell roll by five or more points. So casting's fun, but it can get a little hairy and dangerous. Apprentices, exactly the same as casters, except that they are, um, spells are harder for them to cast. Okay, so that is a very basic overview of the basic mechanics, combat, shooting, casting. Um, so this week, hopefully, I'll get some painting done. I'll get the next installment of Frostgrave in the Warhammer world out. And um, I'll be filming while I paint, so there'll be some of that coming out. The other, the last part of the Frostgrave thing, at the end of the next episode, there will be treasure rolls, there will be experience given out. So all of that part of the mechanics will be in the next video. Uh, the next narrative video. So anyway, again, thank you very much for your patience. Um, for those of you that, that are enjoying it, uh, appreciate your feedback as always. And have fun.